And yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, and now I want to get to who we're here to hear from is our panelists. So uh, our most powerful Latinas, why don't we start with Mina Soto, tell us a little bit about yourselves. It's always great to hear it from you as opposed to me reading something off a page. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and the entire Alpha family for having me today. As, uh, we're always very eager to contribute to the community and the women of Alpha in particular. Um, so very happy to be here today. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'll do it quick. Um, I'm currently serving on the board of directors of three publicly traded companies, uh, CMS Energy, Spirit Airlines, and Popular Inc. And some of you may know Popular Inc. because they actually operate under the name of Banco Popular, Popular Bank in the Northeast. Um, I just recently wrapped up my tenure as COO of a managed security services uh, provider here in the state of Florida, and uh, I'll be announcing something new in a few days. So you guys heard it here first. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, been a, a, a very long fan of Alpha, the entire Alpha community and the leadership team. Uh, just really thrilled to be here and to be able to talk with one of my favorite NPLs, Ani Lu, and I'm going to let you know that I hope she's unmuted because I think she, I saw her muted. A second. Yeah, she's unmuted. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah, but I'm very worried about it because she knows I'm Puerto Rican and that causes a lot of stress for please. me not being able to speak. Uh, and we have and we have two Puerto Ricans, so we got to be able to talk. So. Three, three. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did we not have the flag? Just yeah. the I know we should. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Anilu. Thank you, Myrna. Um, buenas noches, because uh, I think that most of our audience probably on the East Coast. I'm um, in the Bay Area, so it's a little bit earlier for me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Alpha has a special meaning uh, to me, um, and so I, I consider it a privilege to have the opportunity to connect. Uh, with all of you virtually. Um, you know, Myrna, Myrna and I, I think the last time we saw each other was in October at right. the last MPL event in New York, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, I just didn't know that, you know, we were going to get into the situation. But in terms of background about myself, I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico, as you heard. I grew up there. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by background, so I'm, I like to refer to myself as a recovering attorney. Um, and I spent uh, 12 years, um, I, I, actually I was an M&A lawyer, executive comp, having nothing to do with uh, what I went on to do. So we can talk about career transitions um, um, in this panel for sure. Um, I then went on to Goldman Sachs and I was there in New York for about 12 years. Um, depending on how you look at it, you can say that I can't hold a job because I had about <laughs> five different roles um, or maybe uh, I just got lucky, which is how I, how I like to think about it. I, I got to experience a lot of different parts of the firm. Um, and about 20 months ago, I moved to the Bay Area uh, with my family. And I am um, a partner and the Chief Human Resources Officer at TPG Capital, which is a, a private equity firm, um, a global firm. And uh, uh, I think interestingly, in terms of what's going on with me, I also head our crisis management efforts for the firm. Uh, which has been definitely an, an interesting experience um, given what's going on. But I hope that everyone that's listening is um, healthy and safe, and so are yours. Um, so looking forward to chatting with Myrna and with Marie. Great. Thank you both. It's great to have you. So, yeah, as you mentioned, this session is about navigating your career in a challenging time. And I think, you know, we've all gone through, you know, career changes and, uh, nothing like the environment we have right now, right? But um, what kinds of advice do you have for someone that is thinking of a career change or, you know, whether self-imposed or, or forced, right, at this point? Who wants to go first? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on Ani Lu's comment about she can't hold a job. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a wonderful comment for, for, for tonight and what we're talking about. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, it's really important for people to kind of understand that career change comes in many different forms, right? Um, 
you know, traditionally, most people think of career change as moving up the ladder. In other words, moving up and promoting uh, throughout the hierarchy of their organization. Uh, but I truly believe that a lot of growth comes from, uh, you know, a very different type of path, or a lateral path, where people get a chance to learn different things. Currently, we are learning every day. You, you, we opened that up today by talking about the use of the technology for our virtual platform and whatnot. But it's an interesting time where, although there is a, an extreme amount of volatility and uncertainty, it is actually presenting itself to be a great opportunity for people to reinvent themselves and to rethink about how they operate in their careers, how they operate in their roles, and really more important, um, to really be reflective about what we want to do. I had a great conversation recently with a colleague who we were reminiscing about, you know, the path of careers and the fact that we were running at 150 miles an hour and, you know, Annie Lou's managing crisis management right now. And, and obviously this is a very interesting time for that. Um, but it also gives us a chance to put some things in perspective about what's important to us, right? What, what are we really looking for? and What is going to be very, I don't like to use the word happy. I like to use the word satisfied because there is, you know, a, a degree of satisfaction that we're all um, looking for. But um, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in constant growth and constant learning. Um, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with individuals that decide to stay in a, in a role and in position for many years. And on the flip side, there's absolutely nothing wrong with people that say, okay, I've done this, now I wanna do something else. And to go on and, and work on a different role, it's, you know, you'll hear different things. You'll hear recruiters say that they're concerned about you not being around in a role for too long. And I'm here to tell you that that really is a misnomer. As long as you produce results, as long as you've been able to be influential, as long as you've been able to make your mark, it doesn't matter if you're there two years, three years, versus some that will be 10, 15. So. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, like the, the example that I gave, I joke about it, but the reality is, you know, I was um, there 12 years, almost 12 years. If you divide that by five and a half different jobs, um, you can do the math. But the reality is that um, each of those um, experiences, when I look actually at the job that I have now, which I, you know, love and um, it really brings me a lot of satisfaction, like Marina says, there is no way that I could be doing this job if I hadn't had those opportunities. And the reality is that not all of them seemed that sexy at the time. Some of them, quite frankly, seemed like punishment. Um, and, you know, why and why me? Uh, but quite frankly, and, and a lot of them were not my idea um, also. So I think that this is a period where I would recommend that people be very open to things that maybe in the past they haven't. If you have a mentor and they have mentioned something that sounded crazy, don't shut that door and ask them why they're thinking about that opportunity for you because they're probably seeing something in you that you haven't seen yourself. Um, and I also think, you know, I, I got to Goldman in 2007 and then 2008 happened. So the other thing you need to know about me is that my timing is impeccable. <laughs> um, and so, um, I was in a group called employee relations when I was there. And so we were responsible, you can imagine for what type of activity uh, that happened a lot. Um, and as I look back to this moment now where I'm it, right? Like I had a lot of people above me um, in human capital that were making decisions and I got to observe them. Um, the other thing that I would say is don't waste this opportunity to really absorb. I mean, I, this is a terrible um, situation that globally uh, we're going through. That being said, there are some lessons to learn from this situation in whatever position you are, whether you're a student looking to get in the market, whether you had a job and unfortunately it's not there anymore, whether you have it and you have options. And what I would say is, Wherever you are in that spectrum, make sure that you don't waste this opportunity to learn and to be forward in terms of throwing yourself into it. I, I like to say to people, you know, run to the fire yeah. uh, because you, you learn a lot and now you have to have the right temperament for it because there's a lot of stress around this type of situation. But whatever you do, don't stop 
uh, from considering your career and having conversations about your career um, and, and being very diligent about it. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, great points. So you mentioned stress. And, you know, now with everything going on, we have the stress of what's happening and then, you know, add that to, you know, if someone's thinking of changing jobs or, you know, if unfortunately they're forced, they're being forced to change jobs, right? Um, what kind of advice do you have for them in, you know, how to manage that stress and how to stay focused on what they need to do in order to, you know, move on to the next step, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Marina said a word that I think I've thought a lot about. Um, perspective is everything. And, you know, while we're here to talk about careers, the reality is that we, the first thing is, you know, are you healthy? Is your family healthy? And can you provide, you know, for what you have? So obviously, once you take that off the table, right. um, I think that, you know, my recommendation would be that people, you know, we're all in Zoom meetings all day long, whether it's for personal or professional things, right? And I think that there is a moment where you need to just take some time to really reflect, as Marina said also, and this opportunity. And I think that part, you know, my advice is if you find yourself in a situation where the decision unfortunately has been have to be made for you, one, remember that there are business decisions that just need to happen. And so don't let that decision be a reflection on you. Um, there, there are a ton of talented people in this circumstance, the same way that in prior crisis, that are going to find themselves um, unemployed. And so you shouldn't take that as, as something that you're fearful about discussing uh, when you go in the market. And my recommendation is that you be very honest, very open about it. Because people not only will understand, but they will, will be willing to help you if they understand your circumstances. I would also say, if you've been thinking about making a change, whether it might be that you felt that maybe you wanted to go to school or you wanted to try something completely different, be open to doing that. Understand that you might need to take a step back, right? If you're going to go do something that you haven't done before, that may mean, it doesn't always need to mean that, but you have to be open. Now, don't take a step back just because you're changing a job. So that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say, you know, I think, and I get this question, actually, I've gotten this question a lot from either some of my mentees or people that have reached out. I think that this is a, a period of time where if you're going to reach out to people for advice, you have to also be mindful that people are very, very busy. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to be very flexible and creative on when you're going to connect with them. Um, and offer, you know, to get advice on email, you know, through LinkedIn. It doesn't always have to be a call uh, because the days are long. But if you're going to make a call, make it very actionable. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the things I'm worried about. These are the things I think I know. And these are the things that I don't know. And it seems like you know something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would be as crisp as you can. Um, but this is why also I always say, you know, to this community, we really have to build and retain our relationships with each other because it's a lot easier for you to reach out for someone that you have already built a relationship with. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't be shy about it because there's always time for that. And the other thing that I would say is we always try to reach for the more senior person. Mm -hmm. And I find that the best advice that I get is from peers. Um, and so again, I, I look at Myrna and I'm already dying to know what she's up to next uh, <laughs> and hear about her new adventures. But, you know, we have to celebrate each other's accomplishments um, and then also get real advice. Um, so, you know, go, go to your peer as much as you want to go to someone more senior. Yeah, I, I would, I, you know, Annie Lou, you did a phenomenal job answering that question. There's like so little for me to add because you covered everything so well. But one of, one of the things I want to make sure everybody thinks about, um, and I know it's easy for someone to say that when you're going through it, there's always a silver lining. You know, there is, all, I always like to say, there's always a solution. You know, there are people in these times, they're very stressed, they're worried about what's going to happen next, what am I going to do? And if there's that unfortunate unfortunate circumstance where you find yourself forced into a career change. Right. There's always that optimistic, hopeful nature that I always 
try to encourage in my mentees, just look at the silver lining that may be happening. Anilu said some of my, some of her roles were kind of like, mm, she wasn't so sure about them, but they all prepared her for where she is today. I reflect back on my career and, you know, I was in a similar situation. This is very different, I will admit, uh, right after 9-11, right? After 9-11 happened, the industry that I was working in happened to be the hospitality industry, which pretty much froze, somewhat similar to what's happening now. Um, and I found myself on the end of having to make a pretty big decision. Do I stay and stagnate or do I force myself out of my comfort zone? And I talked about this in that event in October at that MPL event about the importance of really stretching, stretching yourself and never being comfortable. So this could very well be an instance where the uncomfort nature of the circumstances are being forced on you, but there is a silver lining and there is an optimistic outlook, which I want to believe you need to believe and you need to carry with you. Um, and going back to the uh, reaching out and, net, you know, utilizing your network, this is the time for you to utilize your personal network, but also to give back. It's also to be able to give to someone else. You may be in career transition, but you may have insight and input and advice to give others. It's really important that we don't forget that it's not a one-way street on networking. We have to be there for each other. We have to make sure that we, I like to call it the karma jar. That I give, I give, I give, I give. And one day I may have to make a withdrawal, but I want to make sure that I am putting enough deposits in there to feel good about who I'm reaching out to. Right. Absolutely. Great advice. So we have a couple of questions that came in. One of them, uh, he's saying that his organization um, has basically pivoted to focusing on COVID-19 response and looking at plans of, you know, some sort of emergency response for the next 18 years. Anilu, with your, you know, uh, disaster recovery work that you're doing now, <laughs> um, you could probably help with this. Um, what advice might you have for networking, learning, professional development when you're on your employer's end, they're not very, um, uh, uh, they're not very, um, they don't want to help you grow. So what can you do in order to grow when your employer isn't supporting that? Yeah, so I think, and I think Myrna's gonna agree with me on this. I think that it depends uh, on how willing you are to, like, is it a, um, a structural issue maybe that they're, they're interested in helping you grow, but they just don't have the resources. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that are in um, startups or firms that maybe just don't have a, you know, human capital team. Uh, but if you went to your boss, they would be willing to support you either get something external or to teach you. If that's not the situation, then you need to change jobs because you, you should not stay. You, you may not be getting paid as much, you may not be getting a promotion, but if you're not growing and learning, uh, that is not the right place. Um, but what I would say is sometimes you just have to create your own opportunities for learning. And again, I think this is a perfect example. We um, at TPG, I'm heading the crisis management team, we have official people on the committee um, and we have more work than we can handle. And let me tell you something, I am not going to turn away any volunteers. So if people come knocking and they want to learn, uh, and we have different pillars, right? Like some of it was about the health and wellness of our employees. Some of it was about making the decision to go to work from home. Now it's the decision of how will we re-enter our office phase? When are we ready for that? But in between that, there are a series of business and strategic decisions we need people who can like model things out for us, you know, like, mm -hmm. so I'll take an associate that wants to model out. And if in exchange, they get to hear the conversation that we as leadership are having around how we make that sure. So I think some of this is we all need to take responsibility for our own destiny. That being said, I don't think, again, I for sure will not want to be ever in a scenario where 
um, on purpose. Um, I am being told not to grow and I will certainly never recommend that to my mentees. Yeah. Um, so you have to evaluate which one is it? Is it that they maybe don't have the right structure, but they have good intentions? Um, or is it that they're really not interested? Right. Yeah. Marina, anything to add? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, Ani Lu and I spent some time together in October and it's a great example of how you get to know somebody really fast because <laughs> she's spot on and she knew I was going to agree with her comments. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that it's important that, um, not only are you, do you take responsibility for your own growth, but that you realize that there is a magic in you asserting yourself. Raise your hand for that uncomfortable assignment um, to think of a task that may be going on in your company and you say, hey, I may not know everything about this, but I'm willing to help. Oh, and by the way, you'll learn it during that process. And, you know, while you're learning and assisting in that process, you're gaining a new skill, you're providing somebody the opportunity to see you perform. You know, I, I always, you know, I always struggle with uh, some of my mentees who, yes, they want to grow, but unfortunately, they kind of want to wait for it to be delivered to them. Um, so you've got to be very purposeful, you have to be very purposeful and very mindful that any opportunity you have to contribute to, to do more outside of your normal role will have a tremendous impact on how you're viewed and how someone may say, wait a minute, you know, we, we got to invest in this person because look what they did. I didn't even ask them and they, you know, they showed up and, and helped. Um, but first and foremost, the most important thing, life is short. You know, you look at a 20 year, 30 year career, it goes by really fast. You want to be in an organization that matches your values. And if you're in an organization that doesn't value you or your coworkers for what they contribute to the business and want you to grow, it's time to find another place. Right. Yeah, and I would add, Myrna went at this from a little bit of a slight different um, angle. I remember every single person that has volunteered to work on a project uh, with me. And in fact, some of them, and some of them actually may be listening, um, from 2008, were in that position. They were junior people, and guess what? Some of them work for me now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the reason for that is that you do remember, you you know, there is you, you being good at the functional part of your job is super important and is you know expected you being very good at managing through ambiguity and to raise your voices, um, Marina said, um, and actually be a team player are also things that as you grow in your career and from a leadership perspective, you, you really don't get the opportunity to demonstrate necessarily on your day to day. So use these opportunities to showcase that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for me, having a great team is key. And so if you see those people that are volunteering for stuff and they're doing a great job, that's who I want on my team, right? Amen. So, Amen. so it means a lot. And another thing I would add to what you guys said is be very uh, focused about what you want to do, right? So if you know you want an XYZ job in the future, you know, understand what skills do you need to get there, right? And if the learning isn't available internally at your organization, go out and find it, right? And I always see it as an investment in myself. So even if my organization isn't able to pay or willing to pay for, for the learning, then I pay for it myself. It's an investment in you. So um, yeah, another question we have, ladies. What's the best way to ask a hiring manager if you've made it to the next interview? So I'm, I'm going to share an experience that I had um, in my career when I was interviewing uh, for a particular role. And I had a gentleman who I interviewed and I, it was a very good interview. Um, and he was very eager. You know, there was no doubt that he was very eager. And at the conclusion of the meeting, I shared with him what the next steps would be. And I, that was a typical thing for me to do to say, you know, we've got some other folks we're going to be talking to and we're going to, you know, follow up and this that, and the other. And he said, is there anything 
that I need to share with you to guarantee my guarantee myself and the next interview. <laughs> and I sat back and I said, that's a great question. Yeah. And you know what? I did have one for him. So what that showed me was, is that there were still some things that I wasn't sure about this candidate, but when he asked that question in the manner that he did, because he was very polite, it wasn't pushy. Right. It made me think about him just a slightly differently and say, you know what there is, how about we talk about this, that, and the other. And guess what he did? He guaranteed himself the next interview because I covered things that normally I would have covered in the next interview. Um, and I, I just was, I was always perplexed by what he did. And I've shared that with so many people and say, find a way before you close to ask the question, is there any other insights I can share with you? Is there, you know, whatever, whatever you could do to kind of like pull that interviewer into right. you as a candidate, I think works really well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I think also, you know, it depends, like if, if you have a recruiter internally, for example, um, that is working with that manager, I really recommend that you become best friends with that recruiter. Um, you know, they're, they're seeing a lot of things um, about that company, about that manager, um, that can really help give you perspective. So don't just think about the hiring manager, use all your resources. I also want to remind people that sending thank you notes is still a thing. It's still a thing. So email, you know, WhatsApp, whatever you want to do, but let's be proper Latinos here. And I will tell you that I notice who doesn't do that. I also notice who just sends me a thank you note and not my team and my junior people in particular. Mm -hmm. So just do as your mother told you, have good manners <laughs> and you'll be fine. I love that, I love that. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> Another question. Um, uh, my organization let me go prior to COVID-19. She's 50 now. And while she's started optimistic, she tends to feel that her age is more of an issue than her skills. So what can she do to make herself a little bit more uh, interested, you know, for the folks hiring? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm immediately shaking my head because um, there may be a point in time right now where you're feeling that way. But the reality is, is that the depth of your experience, age, age aside, the depth of your experiences is what's going to be such a differentiator for you in the marketplace. And that's how you really got to look at it. Um, you know, obviously, you know, in this point of your life, there may be certain roles that you're not interested in doing. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, something that you say, you know what, I just don't want to subject myself to that. And I prefer to do something else. The one thing that I am seeing is with the influx of change that's happening right now, there's going to be a tremendous amount of newness to how we operate. You know, whether we want to admit it or not, you know, we got pushed into this digital transformation. A lot of companies were on a digital transformational uh, journey and got pushed into it quicker because of COVID. And now they're realizing that there's many different ways to perform the day-to-day -day business. There's right. still value. I mean, I'm a firm believer there's still value in coming together physically you know, the hallway conversations, the camaraderie and the collaboration. But I think that what this person needs to think about is, do not look, think of your age as an inhibitor. Turn it into a story about the depth of your experience, the maturity of your role, what, however you can position it. But there's gonna be a lot of new things that are gonna come out of what we are experiencing today. You know, right now we're still kind of like in that squishy part, but there's going to be a lot of new things. Be willing to do something that you've never done before and be able to tell your story of your experience and how it could be applied. You'd be amazed when you look at some of the most successful people, they moved around and did roles that were parallel opposites. It's like, well, here, I'll give you a great example. By my formal education, I'm a psychology major. I thought I wanted to be a therapist. I ended up going into information technology, then later into cybersecurity, then later into venture capitalism. And if you tune in in the next panel, I'll tell you where I'm going. No, but if, if, <laughs> there's all these moves that you can make 
it's really about getting creative about how your experience can be applied. Great, great. Honey Lou? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm not doubting that there will be people that will look at all of us through the lens that they apply to the world. And sometimes that may be age as well. So, but I think what Myrna is talking about is you have to control what you can control. And your mindset is uh, really a lot more important than we acknowledge in terms of how we present in front of the world. And that includes interviews. And so I think that practically speaking, as Myrna said, you might, you, you really have to think about what experience you want to present. And there might be some experience that just because you did it is not relevant anymore to where you want to go. So I'm not saying don't show it in your resume, for example, but that's really not where you want to focus. And I also think that all of us, again, if we think about what we have done, um, you can probably, with the, with the context of, of the moment now, you also can translate some things that we all have in our resumes to why they're relevant now too. So I would say spend time on your resume and how you're presenting that. Spend time getting to know the culture of that firm because if you're getting that vibe, that's a reflection maybe of just that person, in which case you don't need to nix the company altogether, but it might be a reflection of something more in terms of how limited they may be in their thinking about who can contribute. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if you were 25 you and they had that mentality, you might find other reasons why they would uh, put you in a box. So I think a lot of it is mindset. A lot of it is doing the right research ahead of time of where you're going to go so that you don't waste your time with places that may not be receptive. But guess what? There are a lot of places that 50 is not only the new 30, but quite frankly, we need a lot of people that have, thing, have seen things happen before. Oh yeah, I mean, experience, listen, experience and perspective is extremely valuable to companies. Yeah. When, when, and again, applicability, it could be a completely different industry, it could be a completely different type of skill set, but the life experience and the experience in the business what worked, what didn't work, those learnings, you cannot, you just, you can't get a book and open it up and get that. That comes from very deep experience and how you position it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so there's a question about what advice would you have for Latina college grads or just any Latina really um, that are job hunting during this time? Basically, uh, the question is, how have you dealt with the question about salary, given that you know we're underpaid compared to other groups, right? So, how do you deal with that question? Honey Lou, you want me to go first? Because I'll roll yeah, go first. Okay. Go I'll, first. I'll, I'll, I'll roll the grenade. Um, <laughs> go first because I'm going to be taking notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll I'll roll the grenade because uh, I am very passionate about this. Um, we are all historically, it's been proven historically underpaid. Mm -hmm. um, and it is extremely unfortunate. Now, there is, there is the perspective of having to run a business mm -hmm. and be profitable and all companies cannot pay all salaries and cannot just give away the farm. But I think it's extremely important to have knowledge of market rates of roles. Um, and there are tools out there that'll give you some market rates and there's also the ability for you, and I love to say this, I can't take credit for it, but know your value. Know your value. And when you are going through a job interview, a negotiation, whatever, know what your value point is where you will feel, I'm gonna use my other word, satisfied, that you are being given a fair market rate for the role that you will perform. Right. I also uh, give my mentees advice that even if you're close, there's always that opportunity to negotiate a step ladder. Okay, I'm gonna come in at this rate. I'm gonna do the following things. Would you agree that in six months, after I've proven whatever, um, that I will have a step ladder into a higher salary? And you'd be surprised. A lot of companies embrace that because it gives them an opportunity for you to come in. but 
first and foremost, know those market rates, know your value, and know that you have a tremendous lever to offer because you are a Latina and we're underrepresented everywhere. So why would a company not want to pay you a fair market rate to have you join their team and to bring the diversity that Latinas bring to the workforce? Now, all of that, is, it sounds nice, but you have to know your value. And here's how you know, you're gonna have to say no. You're gonna have to decline an offer that just doesn't feel right. And I know that in a time where you're not working and in unemployment, it's probably the hardest thing that you're gonna have to do. But you'd be surprised how they will come back when you decline and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I feel the market rate for this position. I feel my experience. I feel my ability to contribute would warrant a higher, a higher uh, pay rate. I just, I just can't accept. I have to tell you that takes a lot of courage but a lot of them will come back and say, well, what can we do? Yeah. How can we make it work? Yeah. I'll confess. Um, I feel, whomever asked this question, I feel your pain. I am terrible at this, despite I give great advice on it to other people. Uh, but I, I have struggled with this, and I think that many of us do. And I think that the way to combat, like, is partly how Myrna is saying, like, know your facts. Because I, I am terrible when it feels like a personal negotiation, but when you have your facts and when you have confidence that, again, you're willing to pass on a job because it's not the right fit, including on comp. I would also say, and this is true for me, um, remember that the law has changed. So the law actually says that people cannot ask you how much you made anymore. And I, it's been really interesting for me to observe who reveals comp and who doesn't. And particularly when it comes to women or Latinos or any of us that are not in the majority, initially there might be a reaction of like, hmm, well, what are they hiding? Or like, why? You're not hiding anything. You actually don't need to say. You should reply, I would like to get paid what people of my capability get paid for this job at your company. That will be very good with me because I'm, I'm, I'm good. I expect to do a good job for you. So you should pay me what you pay top performers in this job to do this job. Uh, and so I don't mean it as a cop out, but in fact, this is something that if you struggle with it, you should remember that you shouldn't give away information, like you shouldn't be negotiating against yourself. Right. So just be mindful of that little factoid because now pretty much every company now knows that they cannot do that. And some of them try to get cute about it. Yeah. And again, if you're more, more senior, there might be a reason actually why you do want to proactively disclose mm -hmm. your compensation. So you need to be nuanced about it. But, you know, the, the law finally has caught up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, had I, wanna, I wanted to add one, one thing. The, the other question to ask is where the offer that you're being given, where does that fall in your peer group? In other words, am I in line with my peer group? I'm at the 25th percentile. Where am I? That is an immediate trigger to the employer because the, the employer now has to say, okay, am I being fair? Am I being fair? Is it, and if they, if they are affirmative and say, no, you were right there, you know, in the sweet spot with everyone of like skill sets, et cetera, then you have an opportunity to make your own personal decision. Um, but when you ask that question, typically you may get a little flinch, like, well, uh, and that may be an indicator. Um, but there's no harm in asking uh, the fact that you don't have to disclose your previous income, I completely forgot about that because that's a really big, yeah. that's a really big thing. But now the way that they get, um, I like Annie Lou's comment, they get cute. The way, <laughs> they get, the way they get cute is they ask you, what is your expect expectation? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I love it when I get applications that show $1. <laughs> $1. Because they, they, they have to put a number, they have to put a number right. or else it won't go in, <laughs> but they put $1. That tells right. me 
let's talk about it. Let's right. talk about the role. Let's figure it out. Right. But it's a little bit of a dance. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, a, a lot of um, the recruiters will ask, will flat out ask, what are you making or what, are you, what is your range? And I ask them, well, what is the company's range for that position? Right. You know, because it shouldn't matter what I'm currently making. If, you know, their range is X to X, then that's what they're willing to pay. You know, and I should be in that range then, you know, so yeah, it's, it's, they do get tricky. They try to get it out of you some way or another. Uh, I mean, let's see. You know what? It, it's, it's a fair question both ways. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. So many questions. Great. Thank you. Here, um, we'll go with this one. The, um, this kind of relates to, you know, what we expect to see going forward. Um, this is a student, they're graduating in the spring of 2021. Uh, she has a, or he has a banking uh, internship this summer, um, but they're afraid that there won't be any full-time offers or there'll be fewer full-time offers by the time they graduate. So, you know, what do you think is gonna happen in terms of, you know, the industries, the companies, you know, with some companies going, you know, work from home forever now right? Announcing that recently. Um, what do you think are, we can expect going forward? Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share um, having, having the fact that I serve on a bank board. I could tell you that um, the world of finance and banking, uh, it may change. It may change in the form of how many people are physically present in a bank versus not. Uh, but the reality is if you think of the ecosystem that's happening right now with Treasury, with all of the relief funds, with all with the CARES Act, with all of the, these brand new mechanisms that will take some time to mature, in other words, mature in its resolving and the resolving of debt and things of that nature. Right. I got to be honest, I think there's going to be a pent up demand in the banking and finance industry. I think we're going to see you know, new analyst roles, new roles that are going to require a lot more risk assessment, uh, credit line assessments, you know, mortgage lending, I mean, name it, um, just enough that it's going to be a very healthy marketplace. The fact that this individual has an internship uh, before graduating and will have that exposure will be a tremendous experience. I think the one thing that we have to just be comfortable with and accept is that until there's a vaccine and until everyone feels comfortable that the old normal that we had before, we may be working at home more or we may be working in a, in a moderated uh, office space. But I'm a firm believer, listen, I'm a capitalist by heart. I'm a firm believer that the economy is gonna go back to where it was. I'm a firm believer that as soon as we can go back to living our lives the way that we were before, that banking, tourism, transportation, Ani Lu's gonna be busy with her, with her uh, private equity investments. I mean, it's, it's all gonna be there. Um, plus new things, new things that we're not even thinking about right now. Right, right. And yeah, I, I agree with that. And I also would say, you know, I'm, I'm a history major, um, so I can't help myself to kind of like really look at the situation through that lens. And I do think that banks in particular learned a big lesson from how they handled 2008. And the firms that decided that they were going to make short term decisions about summer internships, about rescinding offers for analysts, paid a very hard and high price. And it took them a long time to recover from that. And they lost a lot of talent. And quite frankly, from a diversity perspective, it had a big impact because that pipeline is where every company gets the maximum influx of diversity. We all know that. And so I am encouraged to hear that the internship's still standing. I, again, I'm not a gambling woman, but I would be very surprised if banks decide this um, turn to have a blanket, we're not gonna give offers. I really think that's not in fashion from a talent perspective and to Myrna's perspective, People are very busy in all of these institutions right now. Uh, we are all very busy. Uh, private equity, investment banks, you know, asset managers, you know, and 
there might be different outcomes at the end of the rainbow. We're all gonna have impact to our PNL and to and we're all gonna have to pivot. Um, and so I agree there will be creativity. I would say go into that internship with a super positive, um, you know, not only attitude, but don't expect the worst. People can actually tell if you're like, you know, in pins and needles the whole time. Uh, make sure you're learning, make sure that you're doing all the things that you would have done. And it's going to be complicated because a lot of these internships are now going to be virtual, most of them. And so you will have to find a way to, you know, things that you might have casually be able to do. You have to be very deliberate. Um, and it doesn't hurt for you to keep your options open. So you can walk and chew gum at the same time. So <laughs> do a great job and still, you know, network and find out what other people are doing. Find, keep yourself current on what industries are going to need more people and are going to have to go in that growth trajectory and be open to the fact that you might, you know, change your mind. But do 100% in this internship. It sounds like they're, you know, leaning in, so you should lean in too. Right. Right. Thank you so much. So we're right at almost exactly eight o'clock now. We had a couple questions that we didn't get to, um, but I guess we'll pass it over to Adria and Charlene to close out. Anilu and Mina, thank you so much. I got a lot out of this. You guys are amazing. So thank you so much for, for attending today. Thank you for having us. Big hug. <laughs> Big hug, yes. <laughs> Adria, Charlene, do you guys want to, there you are. Hi, ladies. <laughs> I'm back. Um, thank you, ladies, so much. This was a, a wonderful event. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, Mirna, we're looking forward to the next webinar panel so that we can see where you're going. Yes. <laughs> Best of luck. Um, Anilu, thank you for, for, and all of you ladies, thank you for being vulnerable. I think a lot of times um, we are afraid to be vulnerable, especially amongst our own um, people. So thank you for that. Um, for everyone listening, just a few reminders before we close. MPL nominations are open. Uh, they will be closing July 15th. So please, those that you think um, fit the criteria for a most powerful Latina, definitely do nominate them. We also recorded this session, so if there were any notes um, that you missed, you can always go back and watch it. We are going to work to post this on the Alpha National website. And just we want to leave you with a call to action. So make an effort to reach out to people, connect with them, whether that's via text, whether that's leaving recommendations on their LinkedIn profiles, um, something to recognize them for their work, for their efforts. That way, uh, we are supporting each other and helping each other grow. Um, before we close, ladies, uh, can you leave us with any parting thoughts, your last and final thought for the evening? Parting thoughts. Um, well, first off, I have, to, I have to make a comment of a question that's in the, uh, in the chat, someone that wants to know if it's too late to go to law school. And I know Anilu would be better answering this. <laughs> And I want to say, no, it's never too late. Follow your dreams. In fact, that will be my closing thought. Follow your dreams. Work out of your comfort level. Understand that change is always hard, but there's always a silver lining. And as my mother used to say, I proposito, there's always a reason this is happening. So keep the faith and know that your alpha community is here to support you. Um, and God bless. It's not too late to go to law school for sure, but know why you want to go. Um, and so just do your research about what you're doing next three years. And, um, and it's an investment. So you have to know what you're going to do at the end of the rainbow <laughs> with it. But having gone and I am recovering from it, I still <laughs> love that I went and it's, it's been a critical part of my development. In terms of parting ways, I would say be kind to each other but always stand for the truth, even if that makes you unpopular. Your reputation um, matters more than anything and it will follow you. The only thing that you have that you create, you're the one who builds it, you're the one who can destroy it. So 
just be proud um, of it and make sure that is something that um, gives you purpose and gives you a legacy. And my, my biggest thing is make sure that you bring others along with you. Don't go through that door by yourself. Uh, make sure that you're leaving breadcrumbs um, so that people know where to find you and know the path. Um, and, you know, have friends like Myrna um, and, and be proud, right, of, of what we are all accomplishing. So good luck to everyone. Um, and thanks for having us. Um, Myrna and I had a lot of fun doing this. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, and have a good night, everyone. And look for the recording. We will be posting it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.